this is a uh, 13th in the series of uh, master class which we started about uh, two months back and uh, we we find that a lot of people like these master classes because uh, the topics have been very relevant and we had a wonderful speakers all through so welcome again uh, to isc master class and in the series today we have a uh, one very important clinical topic that is a uh, functional dyspepsia and how do you approach such patient uh, if you if you encounter in an outpatient this is a, a problem which all of us see almost every day in outpatient be, be you might be a physician you might be a gastroenterologist and and these symptoms of functional dyspepsia are very very common in our our society so therefore uh, we we thought that we have to have a master class on this topic which is uh, this is quite relevant and for this we have a uh, speaker dr usha datta uh, she is a professor of gastroenterology at uh, PGI MER Chandigarh. And with this, uh, let me uh, request Dr. Saraswat to welcome you and introduce the speaker and uh, take towards the lecture. And also to introduce Dr. Jayanti, uh, who kindly consented to be the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Govind. Uh, good morning. Once again, a great pleasure to welcome you back to the ISG Masterclass. A slight change this week has been that we have moved from a twice a week uh, format now to weekly classes and henceforth hopefully we'll be seeing each other from 12 to 1 on uh, Sundays uh, for the next uh, couple of months. Part of the program is already put up on the ISG and the master class websites and the remainder will be updated very shortly. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jayanti. Um, good afternoon Dr. Jayanti. Afternoon. All of you know her. She's one of the most eminent teachers from uh, uh, the southern part of our country and uh, an old friend. I think we have been friends for almost 25 years, 20, 25 years, Dr. Jayanti. Yeah, more than and that. One of the most passionate teachers I've come across. One of the things that she is uh, most interested in is teaching and uh, passing on whatever experience all of us have gained to the newer generation of gastroenterologists. And I again, I welcome Dr. Usha Datta. Usha is a professor of gastroenterology at the PGI Postgraduate Institute in Chandigarh and uh, also a very old friend, a person whose career I have followed closely from her days at the All India Institute and then uh, for the last uh, 15 odd years or more, maybe 20 years now at uh, Chandigarh. She is a consumer teacher also. Teaching, she is very methodical, systematic. She slowly takes you over the basic principles and I think it's going to be a treat for all of you to listen to her speak on functional dyspepsia. As you know, dyspepsia not only is a very common condition, but over the years, the terminology that we have used, the semantics of the and the meaning of these terms have been changing. And uh, today, what we mean and what we understand about functional dyspepsia and how to approach and manage it is what is going to be the... Uh, uh, topic for her lecture for the next 45 minutes or so. So with these few words, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Usha to please uh, start her uh, presentation. Share the screen and uh, let's get going. Thank you, Dr. Govind and Dr. Salswat for inviting me to moderate. Over to Usha. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. Thank you, Professor Saraswat. It was a very kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Govin, for inviting me here for this uh, masterclass. It's indeed a pleasure and privilege to be a part of ISG. And especially during this corona epidemic, we are still continuing our academics. That really speaks very highly of our intention to keep academics alive. Thank you for all your introductions. I'll now get, get along with this topic approach to dyspepsia, I have kept it as an Indian perspective for all our Indian audience. Dyspepsia is a Greek word for bad digestion. Symptoms localized to the epigastric region is considered as dyspepsia. So any patient coming with symptoms for more than four weeks in the form of upper abdominal pain, discomfort, nausea, vomiting, heartburn is considered to be dyspepsia. There are varying definitions. So this is the broad definition for dyspepsia. The prevalence worldwide is as high as 30 percent. 
and 5% of them seek consultation. It affects quality of life. It uh, is associated with cost involvement for the patient as well as the healthcare setup. And it adds to a lot of healthcare burden. Fortunately, it is not associated with increased mortality. Cardinal symptoms, that is epigastric pain and epigastric burning, which may be associated with a meal or it, it can be in an empty stomach. This is characterizes the epigastric pain syndrome. The postprandial fullness and early satiety is characterized, it characterizes the postprandial distress syndrome and it is usually meal induced. Along with that, there can be associated symptoms in the form of bloating, belching, nausea and vomiting. But usually nausea and vomiting is only mild or occasional. Significant vomiting means that you should look for other causes which may be like gastric outlet obstruction or gastroparesis. So if we look at the epidemiology worldwide, uh, in North America, it's about 30%. In England, it's about 40%. In the, the Scandinavian countries, about 28%. India is at about 30%. And Japan is about 24%. So it's more or less similar, 25 to 40% all across the world. The interesting thing is that I picked up, there are many studies on dyspepsia in India. I picked up two studies, which are the largest series in India. And one is rural based and one is urban based. The prevalence is about 20% in rural community, 30% in urban community. The most important thing is that the combination of postprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome is far more common than any individual one that is postprandial distress syndrome or epigastric pain syndrome. Post postprandial distress syndrome is the second commonest form of dyspepsia. And about 4 to 14 percent, 30 percent have heartburn. Heartburn does not necessarily translate to GERD, but just symptoms of occasional heartburn may be present in a fair proportion of patients with dyspepsia. In a large study of IBS patients, 49 percent had associated dyspepsia. Now, what are the three terminologies of dyspepsia? First is uninvestigated dyspepsia. That means any patient coming to you for the first time with these symptoms. On history, examination and investigations, we can then classify them as organic or functional. Organic usually comprises about 20 to 30 percent and organic can be of GI causes or non-GI causes. Functional dyspepsia is the bulk that is 70 percent is due to functional dyspepsia. Earlier on, the terminology was non-ulcer dyspepsia. Now, Rome 4 likes to call it disorders of brain-gut interaction. Now, among the organic causes of dyspepsia, let us see what are the GI causes. We are all gastroenterologists, so we are more interested in this component. H. pylori, peptic ulcer disease and gastric cancer. These are all luminal causes of organic dyspepsia. Whereas pancreatic malignancy, pancreatic cancer, pancreatic insufficiency, gallstones, sphincterovodi dysfunction, biliary dyskinesia are the pancreatic or biliary causes of dyspepsia. So we need to rule them out. So when we take the history, it is important to see whether the symptoms are more on the right hypochondria, the spectrum of nausea and vomiting being more significant. The symptoms are usually more severe. LFT abnormalities and ultrasound abnormalities go more in favor of a pancreatic or biliary dyspepsia. Now there are non-GI causes of dyspepsia. We know we see a lot of patients of diabetes, hypothyroidism, organ failures, pregnancy and medications and a fair proportion of these patients have dyspepsia. That is about 70 to 80 percent of these people have dyspepsia. So it's very important in, the, in our history to look for these causes of dyspepsia. So what is the ROME 4 criteria for functional dyspepsia? Dyspepsia is classified as epigastric pain syndrome or postprandial distress syndrome. The symptoms have to be bothersome. That means it has to affect the daily activity of the person. It should be of cognition for the patient. And the duration of symptoms should be minimum of three months. And the onset should be somewhere six months back. So indicating that it's a chronic problem. And it is important to note that in the postprandial distress syndrome, the symptoms have to be present at least three days in a week in the form of postprandial fullness or early satiety. 
whereas epigastric pain syndrome and epigastric burning even once a week qualifies as epigastric pain syndrome and on endoscopy there should be no structural disease which is identifiable just anterior gastritis is not structural disease structural disease i mean a stricture or a polyp or a malignancy or an ulcer those are structural diseases so when we look at the types of functional dyspepsia we have basically postprandial distress syndrome occupying 38% epigastric pain syndrome occupying 27% and 35% an overlap between these two and it is important to note that about one third can have symptoms suggestive of gerd and 14% can have symptoms suggestive of irritable bowel syndrome now what is the pathophysiology of dyspepsia i have kept it very simple it could be acid usually it is not that there is excess acid but the acid is an injurious agent for the gut so that perpetuates inflammation by increasing gut permeability and allowing toxins to get into the system there would be dysmotility in the form of either decreased gastric emptying or lack of fundic relaxation h pylori i will come to that in a greater detail as to how it has any role in dyspepsia there is visceral hypersensitivity which makes that these people even with minimal gastric distension have complaints of pain there can be underlying psychiatric comorbidities in the form of anxiety depression or childhood abuse and stresses duodenal inflammation is coming up as a very important role in dyspepsia in fact increased duodenal eosinophils increased duodenal permeability increased ieels in the duodenum chronic inflammation in the duodenum is an important uh, pathogenic factor which has been identified in the last couple of years so how do we assess what is the cause of the severity of dyspepsia there is a combination of tissue injury either by infection antibiotics or nsaids this in combination with the way we perceive this symptom that is because of our stress child abuse depression or anxiety this translates into symptom severity so it's a combination of these two these are usually mild symptoms but because of perception it may be considered as moderate by the patient so how do we quickly evaluate these patients history we take the symptoms the severity and the nature and the spectrum of symptoms whether there are any systemic illnesses whether the patient is on any drugs such as nsaids very important to take that history uh, aspirin or any other antibiotics or any other drugs which can cause gi injury then the most important thing is to understand that dyspepsia is bad digestion patients are not able to digest it also timing quantity and quality to patients is very important to understand because many people tend to skip their breakfast have a very late night heavy fatty meal spicy meal because that is the time in the day that they are relaxed to have their meal so this kind of a thing creates a problem with the gi system gi system loses its rhythm next is gi infections in the form of a recent gi infection can precipitate post infectious dyspepsia gi infection could also be like an h pylori acute infection which goes on into a chronic state so a history for that should be taken also history of exposure to travel in the form of infections uh, like grd and other uh, organisms then also brief history about what is a kind of perceived stress and what are the alarm symptoms so this is a very important part i'll come to that in the next slide alarm symptoms is age more than 60 years in the western parlance more than 40 years in korea and japan and china presence of gi bleed anemia progressive dysphagia or dinophagia persistent vomiting weight loss which is unintentional family history of gastric cancer and esophageal cancer presence of a palpable lump lymph node or imaging abnormality history of nsaid or aspirin use can all be associated with Uh, are called alarm symptoms presence of one increases the risk of finding an organic lesion presence of more than one increases the risk of organic lesions so we should see whether it's just one symptom or a complex of symptoms on examination we quickly look for obesity or recent weight loss pallor ictus cervical lymph nodes acanthosis nigricans abdominal tenderness or lump and any features of hepatosplenomegaly or ascites and any signs of systemic diseases 
So what do we do as a baseline investigation in these patients? We first do a hemogram. If there's anemia or raised ESR, it suggests that there is possibility of any blood loss, ulcer disease, malignancy or inflammation. We look at the renal function tests to look for any features of chronic kidney disease. Liver function test is important because it may give us an indication for pancreatic or biliary diseases and thyroid function test in all these patients, especially to look for hypothyroidism. Blood sugars, if they are elevated, we know diabetes, 80% can present with dyspepsia. Stool examination is a routine, especially in our country, to look for ovaparasite cysts, as well as occult blood and H. pylori antigen, to which I'll come to later. So these are the simple ways by which you can look for any gross pathology happening in the stomach. Ultrasound for stones, CBD dilatation and pancreas. Sometimes it's difficult to pick up pancreatic lesions on ultrasound, but if there is a suspicion, then a CT scan. But otherwise, routinely, just a screening ultrasound is useful to pick up pancreatic or biliary diseases. Now comes the million dollar question, who needs endoscopy? Definitely those with alarm symptoms need endoscopy. Now, what is the age cutoff for India? We do not have Indian guidelines for this purpose. There has been a lot of debate on this issue. So I will just take you through some key data across West India and Asia, the rest of Asia. Now, if you see the slide, it's very important to know that the amount of dyspepsia across the countries is very similar. The type of dyspepsia in India and the East have most often postprandial distress syndrome. H. pylori prevalence in India is high compared to similar to the East rather than the West. In the West, actually H. pylori prevalence is going down steadily because of improving socioeconomic status. But the thing which I want to draw your attention to is, though the incidence of gastric cancer in India is low, it's not as high as the East, but I think we are missing a lot of early gastric cancer. In the West, less than 1% of patients in less than 40 years are having early gastric cancer. Whereas in India, 14% of our people are less than 40 years who are having early gastric cancer. So if you see the five-year survival of our early gastric, of our gastric cancer is extremely low. That means we are missing a lot of early gastric cancer. And the best time to target that is at the age of 40, if we do an endoscopy in a patient with dyspepsia and look for early gastric cancer, maybe we may be saving a few more lives in our country. In Chennai, there was a large study in 3,432 upper GI endoscopies. 18% of the upper GI cancers were less than 45 years. So they found 43 years was the best cutoff for males and 38 years the best cutoff for females to pick up early gastric cancer. And also we have to understand that the way West has handled upper GI endoscopy is because of insurance issues, cost issues, biopsy uh, processing issues and all that. But in India, it's also a single time visit to the specialist. There's easy access to endoscopy. Cost is not so prohibitive. It is usually out of pocket, so we don't need an insurance clearance for doing an endoscopy. And it's an opportunity to pick up early gastric cancer. However, it's a very common practice. I find patient has had already an endoscopy. You go ahead and repeat it, for which there is no rationale. So if the patient has had an endoscopy in the last two years, please do not repeat it unless the patient has had worsening of symptoms in any major way. The other thing is that endoscopy, what do we look for in endoscopy? You can, in the esophagus, start looking for esophagitis, erosions. You can look for hiatus hernia. You can look for fundic gastritis and atrophy in the fundus. You can look for gastric polyps. You can look for erosions, which are usually drug-induced, NSAID-induced, and again, erosive gastritis. You can have nodularity in the antrum which is usually in children more due to H. pylori gastritis or in adults, we quite often find this chronic atrophic gastritis. You can find a gastric ulcer. You can find linitis plastica, in especially a patient with increased early satiety. There's decrease in the gastric available volume for distension. You quite often are very surprised when you find an advanced gastric cancer, but our aim for endoscopy is to pick up this early gastric cancer. This is one very important message I want to give in this talk that our aim for uh, doing endoscopy in dyspepsia should be to pick up 
early gastric cancer rut properly done so that if this thing can be prevented from progressing that is a uh, a success for us so we should use nbi we should use nbi to pick up h pylori gastritis now most of the people have scopes which have also nbi and this is the pattern which we can see for early gastric cancer there is the detailed lectures on nbi and how to use it for early gastric cancer however i don't have the time to go into that but this should be a very important flagging when you see a patient with uh, dyspepsia undergoing endoscopy you may have a lot of excess gastric residue to suggest that there is gastric emptying issues or you may find a pyloric stricture due to nsaids and in you may find duodenal erosions this is also common in patients uh, with h pylori gastritis or nsaid induced gastritis or you may find nodularity in the duodenum you may find evidence of celiac disease in the form of grooving scalloping and decreased fold height you may find duodenal ulcers in a large meta analysis of 5389 patients 72% have normal endoscopy that is what is expected if in your center you are having more than that that means we are doing unnecessary endoscopies but 13% may have erosive gastritis about 12% have ulcers 1% has barrets a very small percentage will have gastric cancer and esophageal cancer i expect this rates to be higher in our country endoscopic biopsy in upper gi when the upper gi is normal so many people argue why should we do now that you are in you should do it that is by the sydney protocol updated sydney protocol five biopsies are better than three biopsies so first we take it at the antrum on the lesser curvature and the greater curvature at the incisura and at the mid body on both sides if the patient has had ppi and has oh, history of c and there is evidence of ca stomach then fundic biopsy will pick up uh, h pylori which has migrated to the fundus rut it's important to use only validated kits it is very important to understand that rut is positive if there are more than 10 to the power 5 bacteria so when patients are on ppi and we do an endoscopy our h pylori is suppressed and rut will be false negative so it is very important to stop ppi antibiotics and bismuth minimum 2 to 4 weeks prior to endoscopy and so you know day care endoscopy is quite often patients come in and they are on ppi and undergo endoscopy at that time rut may not yield what it needs to yield if the patient is very symptomatic the patient can be switched to antacids and h2ra till the time he or she is waiting for endoscopy another caveat is that once we report at 30 minutes and to say it is negative we need to go to 24 hours before we declare it as negative false negative as i said could be because of low h pylori load the room is very cold for the reaction so temperature has to be adjusted if there is intestinal metaplasia gastric cancer or gi bleed you may have false negative so chronic gastritis on biopsy you may find just chronic inactive gastritis is the commonest biopsy report we get but sometimes you may find activity and especially when you have activity you should look for h pylori so you may find h pylori on uh, hne staining you can do special stainings but most of our pathologists are happy just doing hne staining you may find giardia in the duodenal biopsy uh, this is important the slide is important because in duodenitis you may have increased iel increased inflammation so many patients with dyspepsia may have just increased duodenal inflammation and you may have a lot of eosinophils also you may find incidentally celiac disease also during endoscopy so how do we approach the investigation in a patient with uninvestigated dyspepsia take a good history examination and baseline investigation as outlined rule out non gi causes of dyspepsia if there are alarm symptoms and the patient is more than 40 years in india and if alarm symptoms are present go ahead do a prompt endoscopy biopsy and rut if you find any lesion accordingly you diagnose it as organic dyspepsia and treat if there is no alarm symptom patient is less than 40 years go ahead and do a urea breath test or the stool antigen test if during the corona time i am not very sure whether we want breath test to be done so stool antigen is a good option and if it is positive we consider it as h pylori associated dyspepsia 
and we go ahead and treat. Now, if endoscopy is negative and stool antigen is negative on either end, if both are negative, it will be called as functional dyspepsia. So now we have a case scenario, a very common case scenario, 36 year old man who has bought some postprandial fullness and epigastric pain for six months, no alarm symptoms, no comorbidities, no medications, hemoglobin is good. What should you do? So this is a very common thing in our OPD setting. I'm sure all of you see this day in and day out. Uh, if for this, we need to understand what we do for H. pylori, because if you see dyspepsia and H. pylori, the Indian data, about 60% of our dyspeptics are having evidence of H. pylori by RUT or histology. 60% on stool antigen testing. Seroprevalence is also high, but it is only 10% more than the routine controls. And those who are H. pylori positive more often have severe dyspeptic symptoms. And treatment results with, in the form of eradication results in reduction of the symptom scores. And resolution of symptoms if it resolves, then we call it H. pylori associated dyspepsia. Despite eradication, if the symptoms do not resolve, then it will be called H. pylori eradicated state and functional dyspepsia. So in India, this would be our best strategy for such a patient. You do a non-invasive test like stool antigen and urea bread test. Stool antigen is underutilized. It has a good sensitivity and specificity. Urea bread test also has a good sensitivity and specificity. So we should use these two more often to, ex to diagnose H. pylori in a non-invasive way. If there is indication for endoscopy, then you just go ahead and do an RUT and histopathology that is sufficient and as I already underlined that PPI and antibiotics should be off otherwise a negative RUT does not exclude H. pylori. So how do we go ahead with managing these patients who are having suspected H. pylori? Strategy for management, prompt you, endoscopy. In a person, you want to take a break? Do you to, yeah, want to take a break this time? Uh, give me two seconds I'm coming to a break slide. Give me just about uh, two, three minutes. So strategy for management is prompt endoscopy in patients who are more than 40 years and are having alarm features. The strategy for management, test and treat for H. pylori, especially if age is less than 40, there are no alarm features and this is actually a very cost effective approach. Empirical treatment with just PPI delays the diagnosis is not cost effective and hence should not be our first line strategy in our country. There is a very nice network meta-analysis published recently on 15 RCTs, about 6,000 patients. And what it showed is that the test and the treat policy and prompt endoscopy are the way to go and not empirical acid suppression. Because the test and treat policy has the lowest chance of endoscopy, and the prompt endoscopy strategy has the maximum patient satisfaction. So with this in mind, there is another large net, net meta-analysis which has shown that if you eradicate H. pylori, you have number needed to treat is 14. The response rate for dyspepsia is about 10% better. And benefits overall outweigh the risk for anti-H. pylori therapy in patients with dyspepsia. I will, uh, just before I go on to the break, I'll just share a recent study on Helicobacter pylori from Kashmir, where they had H. pylori prevalence in dyspepsia was 58%. Eradication with triple therapy, they achieved in about 70%. There was, they documented healing of gastritis. There was symptom resolution in 60%, but 52% also in the placebo arm. So there was no significance. But at 12 months, there was again 43% had sustained symptomatic response. But in the placebo arm also, it was 37%. So there was no additional symptomatic improvement despite healing of gastritis. So we should not expect magic with anti H. pylori therapy, but it is indicated. So when and how to eradicate H. pylori? H. pylori, gastric secretions and motor function, it affects the gastric secretion and motor function, small and significant benefit, it's cost effective, it helps in preventing subsequent peptic ulcer disease and malignancy, all guidelines recommend it and ensure a 14-day treatment, standard regimes, compliance and according to the local resistance pattern. So with this, I will give it a break right now and then we will come further. 
you, Dr. Usha, for that um, excellent presentation. Uh, we have quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, I'll read a few of them. One is about the heartburn. Would you like to consider that in the category of dyspepsia? Heartburn. There are at least two people, one from Thirumal from Pondi and uh, Dr. Anand from Chennai. Would yeah, it is important to consider heartburn is a symptom of dyspepsia, but you know, to make a diagnosis of GERD, you need either a 24-hour pH monitoring on one side if you're doing a research study. Otherwise, from a clinical perspective, you need retrosternal burning or uh, heartburn uh, going on, uh, which responds to PPI, uh, four weeks of PPI therapy. So that is what the American College of Gastroenterology recommends, that we should have response to PPI. And in that situation, uh, heartburn, GERD is a separate disease, dyspepsia is a separate disease, there is an overlap and if a patient of dyspepsia has occasional heartburn, we just treat it as dyspepsia. If there's only symptoms of retrosternal burning heartburn, then double dose PPI for eight weeks is a better strategy. If it is only dyspepsia with heartburn, just once a day dose PPI is a better strategy. There's one other question by Dr. Toshnimal from Powai. This bloat is a common problem which we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. So he says if it is within half an hour, you think it is gastric in origin, and if it's beyond half an hour, it is from the small intestine, and therefore is it small intestine or bacterial overgrowth related? So just by the, you know, like immediate bloat versus a delayed bloat. Is it does it make any sense in dyspepsia? Uh I think what I gathered from this question is that the timing of bloating. Yeah. So usually just after a meal, if you are feeling bloated, that is usually re related to gastric bloating. But patients with sm uh, small bowel bacterial overgrowth can have even a delayed bloating. But quite often there is a lot of overlap. It is difficult to just differentiate on the timing per se. Yeah. Uh, uh, one other question by Dr. Sunil from Trivandrum. When the treatment for dyspepsia is either a use of prokinetic or a use of a PPI, is there a need to actually classify patients with dyspepsia or, or an anti H. pylori treatment? So, is there any need at all for uh, classifying dyspepsia? Is there yes, a... It is very important to classify dyspepsia because I will come in my subsequent slide how the classification helps in choosing the therapy and the prognosis of these patients are different. So it is important that we classify dyspepsia and proceed in a systematic way. So you still believe classification is important? Yeah? Yes. Um, Dr. Ajay from Rishikesh, um, gastroparesis is a common problem. So um, in what category would that fit in with functional dyspepsia? Yeah, gastroparesis has to be excluded before we make a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. You know, in functional dyspepsia, you may have a delayed gastric emptying time in about 40% of patients. But as I said earlier, predominant nausea, re recurrent vomiting, and on endoscopy, if you find a lot of residue, you know that there is significant impairment in gastric motor function. In such situations, you should do a solid gastric emptying time and assess whether at four hours, more than 90% has emptied the stomach. If it hasn't, that means there is a motor abnormality of the stomach, which the commonest setting is diabetes. And if it is there, then there are various ways to treat there. There you need prokinetics, better blood sugar control. And also now people have started doing third space endoscopy to relieve the pylorospasm. A question from Dr. Pranya from Dibrugar. Is NBI always necessary to rule out um, in all patients while doing endoscopy in dyspepsia? And also the same question is brought by Dr. Singh from Indore. Is NBI always mandatory while doing an uh, evaluation for patients with dyspepsia? Uh, that's a very pertinent question. Most of our endoscopes nowadays do have NBI. So it is a very simple switch of the button. Minimum at the antrum and the body, it takes an additional four or five minutes to uh, completely examine. And as I said, it is better to, to, to do a single good endoscopy rather than multiple endoscopies which just show some antral gastritis. So NPI should be an added armamentarium in our country in those who are minimum 40 to 
70 80 years of age 40 years plus age we should carefully look for early gastric cancer our yield may be low but definitely we will reduce our uh, advanced cancer mortality so you do recommend ndi um, i think before we go to the uh, as you continue with the session one question from nepal by dr kalki he says that what is the reason for the h pylori migration towards the fundus in patients with the dyspepsia uh, H. pylori likes a lot of acid. So there is a lot of acid in the antrum. So once the uh, there is antral gastritis and there is uh, atrophy and there's pan gastritis, the amount of acid production in the stomach goes down. The only part which still continues to produce the acid is the fundus which has the parietal cells. So the H. pylori goes and sits there in the fundus. So whenever H. pylori migrates there, that's why you need to do fundic biopsy to pick this up. There are a lot of questions on treatment. Dr. Govin, you would like to, or can she continue? We can go with the lecture and then we yeah. come back to this. Yeah. Dr. Usha, please continue. Okay. Um, can I? Yeah, full screen. You make it full screen. Yeah. Am I, is it visible? Uh, yes, go ahead, I think, Musha. We are fine okay. seeing the full screen. Okay, just one second. You. Yeah, so what H. pylori treatment regimes do we have? There's a lot of uh, data on that. I cannot go into all of that. The standard triple therapy, that is PPI, amoxicillin, clarithromycin. PPI, 40 milligram BD of esomeprazole or rabiprazole, 20 milligram BD. Plus amoxicillin, 1 gram BD, clarithromycin, 500 milligram BD in the first week. And this gets continued into the second week. So this is called the standard triple therapy. Uh, it has about 80% success rate. People are not happy with this now because there is increasing resistance in our country to clarithromycin. So we need to substitute this by either levofloxacin or add a fourth drug that is a bismuth to make it more effective in our country. The other additional regimes which have come out of which I like the concomitant therapy because it is simple. 14 day therapy of four drugs. So first week and second week is the same. It's easy to explain and it has a good uh, efficacy rate. So concomitant therapy has PPI, amoxicillin, metronidazole and clarithromycin. In India, again, metronidazole has very high resistance. So we have to substitute it by tetracycline or by bismuth. So this is a four, two week therapy. Uh, sequential therapy and hybrid therapy, I find it sometimes difficult to explain to the patients. So it's two drugs in the first week and three drugs in the second week or two drugs in the first week and four drugs in the second week with near equal efficacy. Recently, vonoprazone based regimes have been used in Japan. It has not yet got introduced into India. High dose amoxicillin based regimes have also found to be effective. Levoflox and bismuth based regimes should be the way we go in our country. So how do you follow up a patient after H. pylori? You give them treatment for two weeks. After two weeks, you give them PPI for two weeks, BD dose. And then after that, no drugs for two weeks and then test for eradication. Eradication can be tested by a uh, urea bread test or H. pylori stool antigen. And we do an upper GI if there was a gastric ulcer uh, because we always want to exclude a malignant gastric ulcer. So this was the scheduled break time. We have already breaked, so we'll go ahead. So how do we have a goal-directed therapy in functional dyspepsia? And as I said, we already discussed on the role of anti-H. pylori therapy. For acid, we have PPI, H2RAs, and antacid on an SOS basis. For dysmotility, we have prokinetic agents. For hypersensitivity, tricyclic antidepressants are very useful and they are underutilized in our country. A very small dose, 25 milligram thrice a day of uh, tricyclic antidepressants are very useful. This is not as an antidepressant, but it is as a modulator of the visceral function. In psychiatric comorbidities, definite uh, depression or uh, psychosis or uh, uh, depression or psychosis, we should try full dose of tricyclic antidepressant SSRI and psychotherapy, which is found to be effective. Uh, increasing role of using uh, antihistaminics in duodenal inflammation, seeing a lot of uh, eosinophils, especially in children, it has been found to be useful. 
so we have a case scenario for 45 year old lady with postprandial fullness which is bothersome early satiety for 6 months so obviously she classifies gets classified as postprandial distress syndrome uh, functional dyspepsia we have to exclude any organic cause there were no alarm symptoms no medications no comorbidities all the workup looks normal are you you have done patient has had an endoscopy done outside that is does not show any structural disease rut is also negative how do we treat so this is our classical functional dyspepsia situation which we have to treat and we'll go through that in a step wise fashion so dyspepsia alarm negative hp negative now that becomes functional dyspepsia now we see whether it's epigastric pain syndrome or the postprandial distress syndrome so the first important thing is to emphasize to the patient that we are entering into a partnership to get the patient's stomach all right or gut all right so unless we enter into a partnership program with the patient just giving drug therapy will fail so we have to understand dietary interventions lifestyle interventions and reassurance because this has 30% effect that is placebo effect and diet and lifestyle also improves patient satisfaction so this is the cornerstone of treatment of functional dyspepsia to which we will add a few drugs if it is epigastric pain syndrome empirical ppi once a day for 8 weeks and if it is postprandial distress syndrome the west recommends ppi the east recommends prokinetics uh so there can be a combination of ppi and prokinetics for 4 to 8 weeks then we assess at the end of 8 weeks if there is response we stop we do not continue beyond that this is another problem in our country most of our patients go on taking ppi over the counter so it's very important at 8 weeks to bring ppi to a stop and you shift it to h2ra or antacids or something like that <coughs> but not continue that endlessly if at the end of 8 weeks patient doesn't show response that is the time to check on psychotherapy add tricyclic antidepressant look at certain combinations and complementary therapy reemphasize diet and lifestyle and reassurance so this slide summarizes how we should manage our patients with functional dyspepsia so anti secretory drugs what is the rationale the acid is not in excess in patients with functional dyspepsia however the duodenum is very sensitive to acid acid also induces gastric dysmotility there's an impaired gastric clearance because the bicarbonate production from the duodenum is low and as i said earlier there is a problem with the duodenal mucosa and acid when you give anti acid suppressants it also suppresses h pylori and the number needed to treat is 9 so there is sufficient rationale to give anti secretory therapy in the form of ppi or h2rs so in a large meta analysis in about 8000 patients ppi definitely scored over placebo number needed to treat being 13 and ppi was equivalent to h2ra in this meta analysis prokinetics also has been shown to be beneficial but number needed to treat is 20 ppi plus prokinetic added very little benefit so really combining these two which is the usual practice may not be scientifically sufficiently rational so this is according to the cochrane uh, meta analysis done recently antacids h2ra in, in functional dyspepsia again it has very good efficacy number needed to treat is 7 but these are all old studies with some publication bias and heterogeneity so this can be used as a second line therapy after the primary symptoms have been suppressed with ppi the important thing as i said in india where we get ppi over the counter in the west you can get it only as a prescription drug and all this ppi causes a lot of problems in our human body system especially it increases bacterial overgrowth atrophic gastritis interstitial nephritis gallbladder dysfunction neutrophilic dysfunction hip fractures and megaloblastic anemia so we should monitor these patients for the same and not continue long standing ppi so the final word in ppi and h2ra is ppi is better than h2ra h2ra is better than placebo and in the initial treatment however in the maintenance phase ppi is equal to h2ra and standard dose is only once a day in eps patients benefit more from ppi than the postprandial distress syndrome but postprandial distress syndrome also benefit from ppi 
Eight week therapy is better than four weeks. If there is no response, you stop at eight weeks. If there is improvement, you taper off after eight weeks. And H2RA antacids, as I said, on an SOS basis, the benefits are there. It's marginal. So prolonging it beyond eight weeks does not have any rationale. So no empirical anti-secretory therapy, as I highlighted before. Uh, prokaryotics, again, as I said, there is a problem with the gastric motility, gastroduodenal coordination, fundic accommodation, and hence there is a role rationale for prokinetics and also the number needed to treat is seven. The disadvantage is that there are lots of side effects, so it cannot be given for a prolonged period of time. So I will not go into the details of these mechanism of action of various prokinetics. All that I will say is that we have metacropamide, which we do not use on a regular basis because of its uh, extrapyramidal side effects. Domperidone is used fairly often in our country because it has less extrapyramidal side effects. 10 milligram thrice a day or sustained release tablets can be given. Levosulfuride 25 milligram thrice a day has been found to be useful and it also decreases the gastric sensitivity. Etopride has also been shown to be beneficial in associated GERD symptoms in 50 milligram thrice a day dose. Akoshimide has now come into Indian market 100 milligram thrice a day which promotes fundic relaxation. So prokinetics, again, number needed to treat is seven. It has fair good efficacy, should be tried in patients with significant postprandial distress syndrome-like symptoms. Akoshimide, as I said, is an oral prokinetic agent introduced in Japan in 2013 and now has come into India. But the cost of therapy is fairly high for uh, four weeks. Number needed to treat is 20. So in Akoshimide, what it does is it helps in this fundic relaxation. Otherwise, the stomach feels very full and bloated. So it helps in the anteral peristalsis, it helps in anterodurinal coordination and helps in fundic relaxation. So this is a scintigraphy which has shown that after treatment, you find that the fundus is now distending and accommodating more food. So less of satiety issues in these patients. And all these symptom scores are better in the group with acoshemite compared to placebo. So then there is this entity of refractory functional dyspepsia. That means you're given treatment for eight weeks, patient does not respond. Whether it was PPI or PPI plus prokinetic or only prokinetic, patient has not shown good response. Uh, so the second line therapy, as I said, is tricyclic antidepressants and psychotherapy. You do an upper GI endoscopy if it has not been done earlier, if it was the test and treat arm, then you do an upper GI endoscopy. Otherwise, if it has already been done, no role of repeating it. Do an ultrasound if you're suspecting a pancreatic or biliary cause. Look for other causes. Reassurance, lifestyle, and dietary modification has to be re-emphasized. So as I said, imipramine, 25 milligram at bedtime for two weeks, and then 50 milligram at bedtime for 10 weeks has been shown to have better efficacy than placebo and has good response rate of about 64%. However, there are some adverse effects, so patients tend to discontinue it. It is a useful drug to try. The psycho uh, psychotropic drugs have also benefit, and the number needed to treat is six. So in patients with definite depression or anxiety, in those group of patients, you can give uh, these therapies either yourself or in combination with discussion with your psychiatric colleagues. Very important to understand that response rate with placebo is as high as 30 to 40 percent. That's why most studies need very large numbers to, uh, you know, do any drug trial because the response rate in the placebo arm is about 40 percent. There is no systematic review, but this is something which we have to give in the form of reassurance and some medications to these patients so that they feel better. So this is a table which summarizes what is the efficacy of H. pylori eradication over placebo, 9% additional benefit, H2RA, 20% additional benefit, PPI, 25% additional benefit, TCA, 26% additional benefit, etopride, 10% additional benefit, aporciamide, 11% additional benefit, and domperidon, 29% additional benefit. So this table summarizes the efficacy over and above placebo. So we know that there is only limited efficacy of this drug, so we should not expect any magic miracle with these drugs. So we should combine it with other forms like diet, reassurance, and lifestyle modifications.
so there are non pharmacological therapies which i said is placebo psychotherapy electrical stimulation medical food gfd many patients i find are uh, intolerant to gfd so they have non celiac gluten sensitivity in them if you exclude uh, wheat these patients tend to do better so for the initial 4 weeks if we avoid gluten these patients tend to do better so what is the overall prognosis the natural history is chronic and fluctuating there is no effect on survival symptoms are persistent in about 20% they resolve in about 50% but fluctuate in about 30% so 70% are going to go on like this up and down uh, throughout their course of illness so diet should be small frequent meals increase fluid increase fiber increase fruits decrease oil decrease overeating especially at night time avoid odd time meals avoid skipping meals avoid skipping breakfast and then having a very late night heavy meal reduce uh, stop smoking decrease your spices decrease caffeine intake avoid nsaids make your lifestyle changes in the form of increasing activity and better sleep so the treatment is no single strategy we do not have no single drug is effective pathophysiology is too many mechanisms symptom base is not always effective so there is no single best uh, uh, treatment it has to be either strategy based pathophysiology based or symptom based you have to individualize according to the patient in front of you so in a simplified approach dyspepsia alarm symptom prompt endoscopy look for h pylori look for any lesions look for early gastric cancer dyspepsia no alarm symptoms in a high prevalence hp zone like india test and treat strategy and confirm eradication if there is dyspepsia no alarm no h pylori see whether it's epigastric pain syndrome or postprandial distress syndrome re emphasize diet like lifestyle and reassurance empirical ppi for 8 weeks for this in this um, empirical ppi with or without prokaryotic for 8 weeks no response try tricyclic antidepressant look for psychotherapy and other complementary therapy and relook at the diet lifestyle and reassurance so what are the take home messages dyspepsia is common and it's a vexing problem for the patient and the physician 70% of the dyspepsia is functional dyspepsia look for associated gerd and ibs because that will help you fine tune the management of these patients a large number of patient with dyspepsia i find also have some constipation so if you give some fiber uh, supplements these patients start improving they feel better carefully rule out organic causes because you get only one chance in that patient who's coming to you to rule it out individualize your approach depending on the socio economic status of the patient the patient's intelligence patient's uh, interest in his own healthcare so individualize it and see if he is likely to come back to you or not if you call him prompt upper gi endoscopy if there's an alarm symptom during endoscopy it is not just an in and out endoscopy look carefully for h pylori look carefully for early gastric cancer use nbi if you can and if the patient does not have alarm symptom you test and treat for h pylori you test it with urea breath test or stool antigen test and if h pylori is positive you treat if there is epigastric pain syndrome ppi od dose for 8 weeks and then stop postprandial distress syndrome ppi plus minus prokinetics for 8 weeks and stop if the patient still has ongoing symptoms try tricyclic antidepressants and make lifestyle modifications avoid empirical long term ppi therapy which is a big problem in our country diet lifestyle and reassurance are cornerstones for this thank you well uh, thank you dr usha and uh, excellent uh, coverage of uh, this extensive topic and uh, you've dealt with a lot of um you've generated a lot of questions uh, as a part of your talk i think the number of questions is about one 67 68 the number is crossed my uh, pushing 170 so what i'll do is i'll uh, take about uh, the next 7 8 minutes some of the important questions that i feel that i've been able to screen out um mm -hmm. the first one of these questions is more to do with the initial part of your talk about uh, definition and what to call dyspepsia mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there is a question from dr arun in indore and dr balaji from bangalore about uh, 
how do you label the subset of patients in whom the symptom duration is less than three months to two and a half months of functional dyspepsia symptoms? And in continuation, uh, Dr. Tirumal from Puducherry wants to know, isn't four weeks of symptoms enough to call it functional dyspepsia? Why do we have to wait for 12 weeks? Yeah, very important uh, practical questions because patients come to you with three weeks or four weeks of symptoms. What do we call them? So usually if there are short duration symptoms, we expect that these patients may have had an acute insult in the form of a recent GI infection or a recent NSAID use or a recent, um, uh, you know, spicy meals and uh, dietary indiscretions. So we expect that these things would settle down. These definitions are usually made because for a research study, Otherwise, we need some standard definition before we put all these patients together. So that is why this thing of four weeks for clinical purposes and three months for functional dyspepsia has been a terminology which Rome, 3 has, Rome 4 has used. So uh, in fact, the American College of Gastroenterology for practical definition, as well as the NICE guidelines, say just four weeks of upper GI symptoms is dyspepsia. In fact, American College of Gastroenterology says only EPS for four weeks is sufficient to call it dyspepsia. So, just I'm, to I'm, I'm just you're happy with four weeks. Yeah, I'm happy with four weeks. Just to interrupt, Nikosa, can you stop sharing your screen so we yeah, can sure. have a gallery view? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I think uh, regarding treatment, there are a whole lot of questions and testing and treatment. Uh, 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 Dr. Siddhesh from Jaipur and Dr. Vimal from Rajkot want to know, most commercial uh, kits of, uh, contain only 1500 milligrams of amoxicillin. So since you've talked about one gram twice daily, should 500 milligrams of amox be added in addition? And in continuation, how about adding probiotics because many people get diarrhea with this problem. And uh, Vimal also feels that adding probiotic might improve response in people with the uh, who are being given this anti-H. pylori treatment. So what do you think? Yes, I think these two are pertinent questions. The only thing I didn't go into the detail of anti-H. pylori therapy because the focus of this talk was dyspepsia. Uh, I agree that most of the kits in India is only 750 milligram of amoxicillin. So what I do is I use a kit and add 250 milligrams morning, evening along with the amoxicillin. And I tell the patient which one is the amoxicillin capsule so that he clubs that 250 with the amoxicillin capsule when he's having it. Uh, definitely, in fact, in now in Vietnam, Malaysia, Japan, they have gone to higher doses of amoxicillin, one gram thrice a day to show better efficacy. Vonaprazone plus high dose amoxicillin has been shown to have very good efficacy. So definitely 750 milligram amoxicillin is out. We have to have minimum one gram BD. And oh. regarding the second question of probiotic, this is common. Yeah, yeah, the, this is common that patients on amoxicillin and clarithromycin tend to develop dysbiosis. So quite often what I do is I give two weeks of therapy with the antibiotic and after that add probiotic for the next two weeks. So that helps in restoring the gut barrier rather than giving antibiotics and probiotics together. And I ask them to take a lot of curd during that period. Okay. Uh, now, I think uh, regarding the stool antigen testing for H. pylori um, and in regard to the test and treat policy. Dr. Balasubram from Chennai wanted to know how expensive is the stool antigen test and Dr. Rishi from Ahmedabad says that in a country like India with high prevalence of H. pylori is it really useful to test uh, stool antigen uh, for H. pylori? Yeah, the answer to that is that it's very important to understand that we don't use stool antigen very effectively in our country. Many countries use stool antigen very effectively only thing is we have to use validated uh, stool antigen tests. I tried one Russian kit. It didn't work in our country. It did not get validated. So if you send it to a private lab, obviously it is expensive about say 1000 or 2000 depending on how they charge. But actually the ELISA kits are not very expensive. If you do it in your own setup, uh, ELISA kit works out to be about 200 rupees per test. So it is not a very expensive test. Only thing it should be validated in your setup so that your strains are similar, which you're looking at. Uh, the you had one more question apart from that stool antigen. The cost you mentioned the cost, okay. and then whether because of the high prevalence of H. pylori stool antigen testing strategy is it really useful in India? 
Yeah, it is useful because serology does not tell you active infection. Urea breath test, you again need a system to pick up the urea breath test. And nowadays, there is a problem with availability of urea breath test at various centers. So stool antigen is a simple test, should be developed. And along with the stool, you can do, you know, occult blood, Giardia. And nowadays, there are, you know, blanket stool screening tests available for Giardia antigen, H. pylori antigen, so that in one go, you can look at all these things. I think as gastroenterologists, we shy away from getting stool examination done very frequently. I mean, in continuation with this, what they were saying was that uh, what Dr. Vishal from Mumbai and Dr. Ankit from Kolkata had uh, the question that uh, before antigen testing, should we stop antibiotic or what is the effect of recent antibiotic and PPI consumption on stool antigen test positivity? Yeah, very, very important uh, question. PPI should be stopped for minimum two weeks, antibiotics for minimum four weeks. Right, so these will have an impact on the stool antigen testing. Uh, similarly, antibody testing, uh, what, what are your thoughts on antibody testing for um, uh, H. pylori? The question is from Dr. Vimal in Rajkot, the rapid antibody card tests are available. Should they be used in routine practice? Uh, which And uh, should that help people to avoid endoscopy? And can that be a basis for treating people for H. pylori if your antibody, a rapid antibody test is positive? Uh, again, a very pertinent question for our country. In India, because our H. pylori prevalence by serology would be about 70 to 80 percent, it does not tell us active infection or past infection. So if the patient has never had anti-H. pylori therapy, for the first time he comes for test to test and treat policy. In the West, they have used antibody kits, uh, rapid uh, in-house tests, rapid uh, office-based tests. So it is a good strategy, but in our country, it is not, uh, we can still use it if it is the first time strategy and the patients never received anti h pylori therapy, but for eradication, it is not a good test. Right. So, and again, Vimal uh, from Ashkot, his question is that should we routinely test after H. pylori treatment for eradication? And if so, what should be the best test? Repeat endoscopy or some other test would be useful for eradication confirmation? Absolutely, we should test for eradication because we know that our efficacy of our regimes is only about 80%. So we should test for eradication. So the way to test it, two weeks of anti-H pylori therapy, no longer seven days, 10 days. So two weeks of therapy, two weeks of BD PPI, and then two weeks off all drugs. Then after that, either do a stool antigen test or do a urea breath test. If the patient had a gastric ulcer, you have to anyway go in for an endoscopy. At that time, you can repeat an RUT and uh, histopathology. Otherwise, a non-invasive test is the best way and all people should be tested for eradication. Right. So in this continuation, because treatment related, there are a lot of uh, queries. Uh, Dr. Bridge from Shimla says that, is it really worth treating H. pylori in India if there is no peptic ulcer, given that we have had a negative study in terms of from the Kashmir study that you yourself quoted just now? What do you think? Uh, is it really worthwhile treating a rather sweeping question, but uh, still it's yeah. a thought in many minds. Yeah, very important question. It is relevant. There's been a lot of debate on this issue. Japan, Taiwan, China do actually screen people in the community for H. pylori and eradicate. Why? In order to reduce CA uh, stomach incidence. So that is their strategy. We cannot go there, but minimum the patients who are coming from the community with dyspepsia to us, if they have H. pylori, we should detect and treat so that we minimum reduce the incidence in that subgroup of people. And we do not know many of our patients, you know, maybe dying of gastric cancer at home. We do not know. So we are underestimating gastric cancer. We may not have it as high as Japan and China, but also Ooh, not as low as what we are seeing. So we should test and treat. And there was an earlier concern about recurrence and recrudescence. So recurrence of H. pylori infection was a problem that we will get reinfected. But I think with improving uh, water and food hygiene standards, the chances of reinfection are actually low. Right. I think the last uh, few questions before I ask Dr. Jayanti, to, um, she's also got a set of questions waiting for you. Um, Dr. Pallavi from uh, New Delhi and Dr. Um, uh, Gautam from Chennai want to know that they have experienced people with documented eradication 
within a few months coming back with a recurrence of infection now recurrence or recurrence is not really being looked at but they have a recurrent infection with symptoms how many times should you treat for urea breath test and if h pylori or breath test um, uh, rapid test is positive then uh, should they go ahead and uh, treat um, uh, with second line drugs if people have record assuming resistance uh, how do you go about this uh, situation yeah so what we do is first line we give first line triple therapy that doesn't work the patient again has rut positive or breath test positive such a patient should be given four drug regime with bismuth based four drug regime and maybe there is clarithromycin resistance so levoflox bismuth amoxicillin and ppi so four drugs for two weeks after that again check for eradication if that has not happened then is the time when you have to actually culture or go into other regimes like voneprazone plus amoxicillin or high dose amoxicillin uh, rifabutin so there are uh, these things become third line therapy so that apart definitely if the patient has recurrence after 8 weeks he should be retreated with a better regime for four, another two i mean the dr gautam's question was about how many times would you treat if a person has recurrent infections uh, and uh, again the question would be each time you are treating and you are not actually testing for resistance has the regime got to change yes because that is what i said after for second time you treat and the patient again has a recurrence he needs to be referred to a center where you can actually culture the h pylori and assess the resistance pattern maybe he is resistant to clarithromycin and amoxicillin so then you have to look for other but options. you would be happy treating them repeatedly three times four times multiple times if uh, it has to be individualized maybe there is a problem of compliance maybe this is a particularly very resistant h pylori maybe we have to assess the risk baseline risk for gastric cancer in that patient and uh, see whether probiotics can help see what is the trigger in this particular patient so right. that has to be individualized okay thank you i think uh, dr uh, jayanti i hope uh, there are quite a few questions but i'll address three or four of them mm-hmm. dr yadav from indore in the current covid pandemic uh, where do you think endoscopy would uh, play a role in evaluation of patients with dyspepsia Yeah, and very. Think, uh, and do you think lifestyle modification would be the way forward before we evaluate these patients? This is a question from Dr. Yadav from Indore. Yes, I agree with uh, Dr. Yadav that during this COVID pandemic, endoscopy is not the option we have for these patients. So that is why either stool antigen test may be the only practical option. If not, we can now. you know go back on serology if the patient has a lot of dyspeptic symptoms has never received anti h pylori therapy we can use serology for this covid epidemic period we do not use breath re- breath test and we do not use upper gi endoscopy for diagnosis of h pylori the other question is from dr sanjeev hubli and dr pallavi in the current um, social media telling a lot about h2 ra and its uh, problems related to that where does it stand in management of patients with dyspepsia um, h2 ra has been found to be very effective in studies in japan korea and china they usually use a lot of h2 ra and we also used to use a lot of h2 ra earlier on i remember even now i give famotidine and zintac for you know chronic maintenance therapy i don't put patients on chronic ppi so h2ra is very cheap famotidine is 40 paisa and zintac is less than a rupee so we should use these things more often in mild symptoms and not give ppi for uh, these symptoms okay. and regarding the h2ra controversy i think that has more or less got sorted out uh, the in, that risk of increased malignancy is actually only for a particular uh, you know Uh, process chemical process in that so the famotidine zintac that we use and the famotidine that we use is safe the famotidine is safe yeah um, there are several questions on belch phenomenon so can you just address that it's a common problem in day to day practice aerophagia belch phenomenon where does it fit in dyspepsia and uh, maybe just one or two words on management yeah the rome 4 had taken out belching and uh, this uh, belch phenomenon out of dyspepsia functional dyspepsia saying that any patient with dyspepsia who has this belching repeated aerophagy and belching you first rule that out and take it as a functional esophageal disorder rather than a dyspepsia related 
thing. So uh, quite often these patients are very anxious. If you see these patients who are belching, they have a lot of aerophagy and they are belching. So if you reassure them and explain to them the whole process, that belching reduces with time. And uh, along with that, H2RA can help if it is just an isolated belching and... Uh, yeah. And one last question from Rishabh Gupta from Jaipur. Any role of intragastric manometry in functional dyspepsia, especially the postperineal distress and gastroparesis, intragastric manometry? Uh, intragastric manometry is practically a time-consuming thing, can be used for research purposes, but for practical patient care purposes, it is not very useful. What we do is in patients with a lot of postprandial distress syndrome where we expect delayed gastric emptying, we do an idli based gastric emptying time where we have our own indigenous method. We use a Gitska idli packet so that we add technetium and then we bake the idli like how routinely idli is made and give it to the patient two idlis with a glass of water and that technetium is followed up for about four hours. So if more than 90% empties in four hours, you know that the gastric emptying time is good. If it is not, then these are the patients who may benefit with prokinetics. So we can switch prokinetics, you know, give domperidon. If patient stops responding, then change to other prokinetic because there's a component of tachyphylaxis with these prokinetics. One uh, final question from Calcutta, Dr. Anshuman saying in pregnancy with dyspepsia, um, you recommend H2RA or a PPI? Uh, in pregnancy with dyspepsia, the if the dyspepsia is significant, then first of all, I usually reassure patients that it is related to pregnancy and it will subside. If it is bothersome and it is troubling the patient, that is the time you need. Uh, omeprazole is a class B agent so we have to be careful when we prescribe people uh, ppi can be given in severe symptoms otherwise h2ra is a good option in these patients antacids head and elevation lifestyle changes all those are more useful in this patient during pregnancy we minimize drug use thank you dr usha over to dr govind and dr saraswat dr govind you to unmute govind unmute please unmute questions uh, which I want to highlight. Uh, uh, one question is uh, uh, a person asked that uh, would you investigate for celiac disease in patient with uh, dyspepsia? And yes, please. Yeah, celiac is Govin's uh, forte area. Uh, as far as celiac disease, any patient who is having dyspepsia and also having some diarrhea, anemia, weight loss, some features of malabsorption. Uh, in such kind of situation, definitely we should look for celiac disease. And it's a very simple test, IgA TTG. And in Govind's study also, they have shown 1% of Indians are having uh, celiac disease antibody positive. So it is a good strategy in patients with dyspepsia, especially in North India, when I see patients, very common to see a lot of celiac disease. So in them, we do an IgA TTG as a routine purpose. And during endoscopy, I look at the duodenum for any grooving, scalloping, mosaic pattern. Yes, truly. So uh, Dr. Dilavri, I wanted to ask one question that uh, uh, the practice of doing stool test for parasite, uh, most gastro don't do that. So do you want to say something on that? Uh, it's nice to hear that Dr. Dilavri is sitting and hearing a lecture on dyspepsia. Thank you, sir. Uh, stool test is underutilized because you know it is unpleasant to tell the patient then the patient gives the lab the lab is also not very interested but I think you know things are moving from GRDR on just microscopy to GRDR antigen based test so in stool if we go to antigen based test we will have better sensitivity better pickup and more reliable results than observer dependent you know search for GRDR and all these things uh, I remember as an undergraduate reading a book on, of Chatterjee on parasitology and then I realized ultimately you have to give albendazole 400 milligram one and another repeat after two weeks. Why understand all the life cycles of everything? But I think minimum with uh, a single stool test with antigens may be a useful thing in our country. And one last question I want to ask is uh, Dr. Bhavesh from Lucknow wanted to know the duodenal dysphilia what how does it affect symptoms and uh, what practice do we change do we ask our pathologist once we send biopsy also the two questions once you do endoscopy 
should you get duodenal biopsy to look for duodenal syphilia? And if you find, so, uh, you ask the pathologist to find for it, and then you find what do you do? Yeah, very important and pertinent question. In fact, uh, in the latest review in Nature, uh, Nick Talley and the group, and Nick Talley had also uh, had a full review in NEJM on role of duodenal eosinophilia and dyspepsia. The understanding is that in dyspepsia, the seat of pathology may be in the duodenum, not in the stomach. We keep searching for it in the stomach, but duodenum is a seat of digestion. Duodenum is a seat for the bicarb. Duodenum is a seat where there is this ongoing inflammation interrupts the enterochromaffin cell signaling and interrupts the all the hormone production. So people have found that there's increased permeability of duodenum, excess of eosinophils. And in this subgroup of patients, the feeling is that to look for food triggers in terms of allergies, if somebody has a problem with, say, any particular kind of food, peanuts or any particular kind of food allergy. So I find what are the triggers in the patient, I try to ask them to avoid it for a week or two and see whether reintroduction results in recurrence of the symptom. And this duodenal inflammation increases the sensitivity of the duodenum to acidification. So that triggers the symptoms. So duodenal healing is important. Regarding duodenal biopsy in a routine endoscopy, I do it uh, whenever I find any, any abnormality visible on endoscopy. Uh, whether we should biopsy a normal looking duodenum, I don't think so. But definitely an abnormal looking duodenum, you should biopsy and you should look for abnormality. I usually use NBI in the duodenum to pick up subtle abnormalities and take biopsies and quite often we find chronic inflammation and increase IEO and celiac negative. Absolutely. One thing is very clear that uh, uh, just go in and come out endoscopy is no, uh, is not this should be strategy. Even for patients with dyspepsia, endoscopy should be like a done properly. You should spend time looking at the lesion, looking at early gastric cancer, doing NBI, looking at duodenum. So we need to spend time. Most of us sometimes just go, go in and come out that's probably not the right strategy. And then here is the change that we uh, should learn to change practice that, so that we provide uh, uh, adequate care to our patients. Uh, with this, uh, I think we will have to close here. But before we do that, uh, uh, Dr. Rajkumar from Bhavaneswar wrote that uh, this was a crystal clear presentation. Okay. Absolutely fantastic. And all, I think all of us, Dr. Saraswat, Dr. Jayanti, and all the viewers, uh, we'd like to say to you, that it was a very clear presentation, simplified simplified algorithms. That's wonderful. That all the algorithms which are very complicated, one page algorithms on the textbook and review articles, but you fragmented them into small, small pieces and make things clear. More importantly, your, your algorithm on the principles of therapy, not only PPI or prokinetics. Once we call dyspepsia, it strikes our mind that we are talking about PPI and prokinetics, but we have more to do. If you do only PPI and prokinetics, the costs are sold that only 30 to 40 percent will get benefit the rest will not get benefit so we need to learn i need to learn from the kosa that uh, for this master class that there are much more to do and i'm thinking of uh, uh, using sometime antidepressants and uh, other uh, therapies so it was a treat to watch and treat to listen to you the kosa for a wonderful wonderful talk and this was the principles of isc master class that you want to create a some of the important concepts in medicine and change practice. Uh, with this, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jayanti, for uh, very graciously joining the masterclass. And uh, we are so, so happy to see you after such a long time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saraswat, uh, for uh, always supporting masterclasses. Uh, thank you, technical team. Thank you, Yogita. Uh, thank you, uh, so the opportunity. And it was wonderful sharing my thoughts. Uh, in fact, last one month, I did a lot of reading. So it helped my understanding further because I was just in the same state as most people. Uh, as we keep on reading, we learn more and more. So that is a very nice thing. And I'm also a part of the National Dyspepsia Task Force. So we are making this task force so that we can get better answers, which are suitable for our country. And what anti h therapy should be best for the country should be our next step. What is that's our that's registry? Step, in Usha, because without Indian data, we are generally following Asian, yeah. Western data and recommendations. And from the number of questions we have had about concerns about repeated courses of treatment and so on, 
there is great need for developing indian data and i think today we have the tools and the means uh to go ahead and it's nice to know that you will be leading that task force and uh, you'll be part of uh, gathering data and hopefully we'll have objective evidence to base our recommendations on for such future master classes thank you usha so there are, there are two things for for the isc task force but usha is uh, uh, the chairing this task force uh, actively with amit datta uh, the two things that uh, we need to have data on dyspepsia from our country then what is the role of explorai treatment uh, what effect and thirdly we need to have our own guidelines on this pepsia so three tasks the uh, kosa is taking uh, taking lead in and before we close uh, uh, we need to invite you for the one more master class uh, next week uh, not, uh, in the series of master class that is on next sunday that is june 7 the topic again is important clinical topic that is uh, how do you treat uh, autoimmune liver disease and this will be dealt by dr salimar uh, sir salimar is a additional professor at all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and uh, so we will have uh, one next lecture on autoimmune liver disease on sunday june 7 12 to 1 with this uh, uh, we say bye bye to you and we'll see you on uh, june 27 at our usual time 12 to 1 thank you bye bye thank you thank you very